to see. I, I, I did find it interesting that the inspectors asked for more time and indeed more inspectors. I have always argued that for me it is not simply does he have weapons of mass destruction, it is centrally and essentially does he have them, is he capable of delivering them, does he have the intention of delivering them and then with the UN mandate for war but that that kind of war, I think, has got to be defined as well, then I would certainly back it, but not before and not until. Uh, Professor Graffy, why the rush? Why now? Why not more time? Uh, I think you mean the rush after 11 years that we're going to be uh, moving into this headlong. I think that 11 years has been enough. And I think that uh, your opening about the millions marching around the world sent a very powerful message to Saddam Hussein. And the message was that he can keep on for another 11 years in preventing disarmament. We know from an interview with the Egyptian Weekly that he said, we have to buy some more time and the American-British coalition will disintegrate because of internal reasons and because of the pressure of public opinion in the American and British Linda states. Jackson, so he's you, were, you, were, you were with those demonstrations. <clears throat> you were giving Saddam a chance to get off the hook. Well, first of all, it isn't 11 years. It's... Um, when was it? Three 98. No, no, oh, 98. 98. When, when they, when they that left. the inspectors withdrew. Up at that point, 90% of his weapons had been destroyed. Um, certainly, we have argued, my government has argued, that we've worked very, very hard to get those UN inspectors back in. And I believe it was Hans Blix who said, why, after innumerable resolutions, um, 12 years, does this thing have to be settled within eight weeks? I thought the whole point of working so hard to get the inspectors back in was to find out if he has those weapons of mass destruction. They haven't found them yet. And once having been found, to have them destroyed. It's, it's, the burden of proof is on Saddam Hussein. The resolution said that he is in continuing breach. And we know from the weapons inspectors who left in 1998 that there was unaccounted for VX anthrax and he either has to say where they are or he has to show how where they how they he is not cooperating he is in continuing breach let he me cooperate let He's me raise allowing overflights of spy satellites like the u2 which uh, was actually in the 1441 resolution yeah. it said in the resolution that he had to allow those reconnaissance missions okay no, only, only let me let me pause, ask, ask you to pause while well, i bring you on okay. precisely this question francois Iceberg. Um, the, the French government has led the way for demanding more time. You would agree, would you not, though, that um, the demand that the Iraqis should provide immediate active cooperation is very far, so far, from being delivered? Well, Hans Blix, in, in his latest report, uh, actually did uh, demonstrate that there was a beginning of a process. But what is clear uh, uh, is that unrelenting pressure from the international community is going to be required if the inspectors are going to make headway. And that may indeed, at the, at the end of the course, as it were, lead to the use of force. But we but haven't, there's no rush. We haven't reached that point. There was nothing in what Colin Powell said on the 5th of February which could lead one to believe that there would be a major danger if war were averted for the time being. There is no particular reason why war should begin on the 26th or the 27th of February. Uh, well, Gwyn Prince, hold, 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 hold on, 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 the case for war. <laughs> no, not <laughs> mine. <laughs> Gwyn Prince, the uh, inspectors are there, Iraq is under the most intense scrutiny. Isn't Francois Eisberg's point that there's no need for a rush, a rather potent one, given the consequences of war? Well, it would have been a potent point if we had had this sort of behavior much earlier. Um, it's too late in the process now. And can I just correct a, a common misunderstanding which Glenda Jackson has, which is that the inspectors are there to look for weapons. They're not there to look for weapons. And as Hans Blix pointed out, it's nothing to do with numbers of weapons or amount of time. It's lack of cooperation. And this being so, 1441, which was a magnificent achievement, was achieved unanimously by the Security Council. And what 1441 says, as you've just reminded us, is firstly that this man is already in breach. He is guilty and has to prove himself innocent. Secondly, in Clause 7, it spells out a number of very precise things that he has to do in the last chance, which, by the way, expired in December. But, but you said the last chance done. expired in December. Uh, Francois Eisberg, it doesn't as precisely as that 
does it? No, first of all, it's not as precise as that. Secondly, it's not because something is legal that it becomes wise and necessary. 1441 does indeed provide a solid legal basis for military operations, uh, rather more solid than the one uh, we had when we engaged into the Kosovo air war, which was a necessary war, but whose legal foundations were actually rather weaker than this L one. But this time around, this time around, the war is as at the present stage, in any case, neither wise nor necessary. Well, you, you said, uh, let me put a further point to you that is made, uh, not least, by the, um, the Americans, that you have, uh, or France has, uh, uh, as it were, sought to get, in effect, Saddam off the hook, because if you'd got your way all this way, the, the military wouldn't have gone, he wouldn't be preparing for war in Turkey, and he'd be under no pressure. Well, what is true is that the, uh, without the pressure from the Americans to bring this whole issue back to the Security Council, we would not have gotten the inspectors back into Iraq, we would not have gotten to where we are with the latest Blix report. And this is something we should not forget. Do you accept that, Glenda Jackson? Accept what am I being asked asking to, to accept? accept whether, or, whether or not it was the pressure from the Americans that got the inspectors back in, and without that, Saddam would have still been unleashed. Well, my understanding was that America had said that it was going to go with or without the United Nations. It That's was our pressure. government that actually said, no, no, you have to go the UN route. Um, we did get that unanimous um, response from the Security Council. But we're all skating over what is the biggest single issue here. Why is he more dangerous now than he was a year ago, than he was in 98? Why is he a real and present danger to my country? How is it possible that anyone could conceive that he, for example, could actually land one of these missiles that he's supposedly uh, developing on, which I understand has a range of 120 miles on Heathrow. It certainly could never ever get to the mainland of the United States. Colin Graffi, how is he a risk? risk? How, real how, how, how is he a significant no risk to this to country? Because we know that he has weapons of mass destruction, anthrax, VX, bio, um, botulium, that he's not revealed. And we also, and all he needs is clandestine foot soldiers to bring it into any major city in the world. We also know that there are terrorist groups and cells all around the world that are ready to do exactly that. All you need for this incendiary element to explode is the little spark of connecting the two together. And that is going but to happen. Isn't the, the problem with this spark? This spark is an extraordinarily tenuous uh, link, is Absolutely. it not? No, Would you, the spark we, actually we know, catch fire? We know he has anthrax. We know it takes only a teaspoon of anthrax. Look what happened in the United States with hundreds in hospital and two dead. Let, let, me, let me just, on, on that, bring in Francois. Do you, you, this is your, one of your areas of study. Indeed. Do you rate the terrorist threat or the putative terrorist threat in the same way as uh, Professor Graffi does? I, I am utterly unconvinced by the relationship which has been attempted to be established by the Americans between Al-Qaeda and, 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 and the Iraqis. With that. I would also add... I would, I would also add that uh, Saddam Hussein has had this, these awful weapons for quite a long time now. He's had the chemical weapons at least since the late 70s. He's used them on the battlefield as against his own people during the 80s. He's had anthrax at least since the end of the 80s. None of this provides any particular comfort, but it does not make a clear case for ooh la 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 la, he's going to attack yes, tomorrow. We, uh, okay. uh, this is. Uh, and this also, is, this, can this, I just this, add? The, 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 I'm going the, the to. I'm going to you, you will have a chance to come in on threats. more of this later when we when we when we when I bring the audience in, which is I'm very there, anxious. Again, I want to. There is up. no aspect of imminent threat here, and, and that's that's imminent what struck me. That's the dog. Going exactly. out in an that's the dog like that, that didn't that bark. That is imminent. That's exactly. the dog that didn't bark in Colin Powell's speech. Exactly. He showed the vial of anthrax. The only anthrax attack we've had in the world until now has been an anthrax attack in the United States. So, Pro, uh, with apparently pause, strains pause, pause, pause which were developed in the United exactly. States. Pause, pause, pause wrong there. target, wrong place, okay. wrong pa time. Ho hold Trump. it, hold it there, H hold it there, and let me. I want to touch on one related issue before I invite the audience to come in, and that's that's this. Uh, uh, Tony Blair has uh, yesterday sought to make the case that there was a powerful moral argument for toppling Saddam Hussein. Now you, Glenda Jackson, have a long history of being a human rights activist, yet you appear to be unmoved by that supportive there argument are two for things. war. There are two things that I found particularly awful. 
The first one was when the Prime Minister said if a million people walked, that would be less than the people Saddam Hussein had killed in his two wars. As always, he elided over the fact that one of those wars against Iran was funded, supported, armoured by the United States, including chemical weapons. It was again a Republican administration who was in power. He then raised the issue of the plight of the Iraqi people and he regarded it as a moral crusade to free them. I have been sitting in the, the chamber of the House of Commons for 11 years now. And not exclusively, but almost invariably, Tam Diel and George Galloway have risen to their feet and have detailed absolutely the horrors under which the Iraqi people have been living. And without exception, the response of the ministers has been nothing to do with us, Gov. If the people of Iraq are to be put in a happier situation, Saddam Hussein has to meet the, what the UN has told them to do, and then we lift the sanctions. Next question, please. Win Prince on that. This really is an unhelpful way of representing a terribly important issue. Thank what you. we have got is a situation which has existed for a long time, and the causes of which we can all agree are complicity on all sides. But the situation with regard to this democidal, tyrannous regime, as you know, is that it has predated on its own people. And an important part of 1441 is that it includes a recycle of the world community's views on that. Now, my own view is that there are three layers at which you can make the case for taking action now. The weakest, we have all agreed, is the one which says there is, is the some sort of one. terrorist link. The second, which relates to weapons of mass destruction, is hard to make in a democracy because for obvious reasons, much of the information which should be displayed couldn't possibly be if at some stage military action has to be taken to remove them. Mm -hmm. But the one which is absolutely clear amongst us, and for me the most important, and this has been my position throughout, which is how, having long been a dove, I suddenly discovered myself a hawk, is the moral case. And the moral case is that we have a debt of honour to the people of Iraq who were betrayed at the end of the Gulf War. So you're suggesting, are we, that we should, although we didn't, have gone into Cambodia when Pol Pot was slaughtering his people? But if we should, it, but we them. didn't, excuse me, we should have gone into Burma when the junta there was actually sending children down jungle pathways to ensure that if there, there were mines, they would be exploded, mm -hmm. so the soldiers walking behind mm -hmm. those children would not be damaged. Mm -hmm. If we are position, going down a road fine, where this the country, is, the, the world is to be at war, Mm. Uh, on the basis of abuse of human rights, we mm. are going to be permanently at war because the list mm. is endless. Okay, yes. just hold, hold, hold. If you would, if you would hold that there, because we can come to that. We, you, you've both made very clear opposite cases. Let me pick up you as an analyst on, on this, mm. Professor Prince. Um, Tony Blair seems to be in, in a curious position now, isn't he? Because he says, if they uh, do get rid of, or we find the weapons of mass destruction, then Saddam can stay in power. And yet in the same breath, he says, it would be inhumane for him to remain in power. You can't run both horses at once coherently, can you? Um, I think that the Prime Minister has a difficulty in that. And as, I've just, as I, I have just indicated, uh, I believe that what he's doing now is to move to the stronger position, which is the one that I have just been outlining. OK, I'm going to bring in our audience, otherwise I will be um, handed out of the studio. The, the guy sitting right in the middle, three rows back. And I'm, I feel for the people of Iraq at the moment, people like Linda Jackson and the millions who went out there yesterday didn't actually bother to condemn Saddam's regime for his awful human rights record. Two million Iraqis have been slaughtered by Saddam. What are the people doing to help Did them? Did you say you're an Iraqi? Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I feel war is uh, killing innocent civilians is not the right thing, but international pressure to drive Saddam out and helping Iraqi people to do that is the best way to do We've it. We've always Thank condemned you. Saddam Hussein. Everybody on that I'm march not hearing condemned it. Saddam then Hussein. I, went, I was there to deliver Everybody. leaflets against Saddam and people threw it back at me. They said, this is not about Saddam, this is about America. Exactly. What okay. will exactly. the Iraqi well, people... Right. Who will help the, 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 the person who's third, third row, second in. Will they, yep, you. Um, I think that... Uh, People over the last, all over the world have been horrified at the way the international consensus has been broken over the last week. And I think that Tony Blair is the only man in, in, ma in the la major sort of political uh, arena to actually, who has a foot in both continents. Now, what I'd like to see over the next few weeks is the f people in the Franco-German plan actually accepting the need for regime change 
and people in the um, and regime change and disarmament in a very real and serious way, and people from the Republicans in America to seriously consider the idea of not actually having aggressive military action. A synthesis of these two ideas would be brilliant for all people who are threatened by the prospect of war, which would and, and we'll pick uh, up on, just we'll shatter pick the fragile politics and business climate and, and economic uh, environment of the whole world. We'll pick up on those thoughts a little bit later. Thank you. Down here, just in the front row, second in, you, ma'am. Um, I went on the march yesterday because I fundamentally believe that what Saddam, Saddam's ideology is wrong. And I also went on the march yesterday because I believe the world belongs to everyone. And I think that we were all represented. It doesn't just belong to the United States. And my concern, and I hope that someone here can answer it for me, is that has anyone thought ahead? What will be the repercussions if we bomb Iraq into oblivion? I mean, Bali is not in the United States. Um, Nairobi is not in the United States. States. And so there'll be terrorist attacks everywhere exactly. if you wake a sleeping giant, if you like. And that's my concern. And I'd like it alleviated here this evening. Well, this let afternoon. me pick that up with, with Grimpins. One, it is difficult not to acknowledge, is it not, with people who have knowledge, knowledge of the Middle East, to presume that that isn't the, 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 the likely consequence of military action of the kind that's just been described. Well, it is a consequence. It's by no means the most likely. The most likely consequence, I'm sorry to say, of yesterday is that it has brought the prospect of using armed force physically much closer. And that is because it's compromised the way that our armed forces have been in action over the last five or six weeks. Because, after all, you use armed forces not just when they fire their guns. As Francois said, and I entirely agreed with him, in his initial in intervention. We wouldn't be here if we had not deployed the uh, forces to the Middle East in the way that we now have. I think that the likelihood of a situation arising at the end of this, if we do not take action over Saddam, where we then have a proliferation of the problems which will then have to be addressed in other places, is much greater. Okay, excuse Down, me, can I, Yes, no, you can. Yes, I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, are you actually saying that um, uh, you are totally discounting, are you, that if the argument had not won uh, acceptance by the present um, uh, American administration, if, if no one had said to them, you have to go the UN route, they would not now be bombing Iraq? I found that very difficult to accept, I, particularly I, as my government has made it abundantly clear. Well, it was that clear if there that is, Colin Powell if there wanted is to go to the United second Nations. UN resolution, but if one, and it looks as though there may be more than one, of the five permanent members of the Security Council veto it, we will still go to war. Okay, other points. D down here. Wasn't the, the government who actually funded Iraq and there were all the weapons? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Of it was. At, at, at a certain yeah. time. The, the, the man with the T-shirt and the white stripes on the T-shirt, third row back. You're wearing the white t-shirt, blue t-shirt with the white stripes in it. Yeah, well, Far away. The t-shirt, yeah. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> sweater. Okay. I should have been more precise. Okay. The argument saying that actually Britain and the United States funded the Iraqi regime to build weapons of mass destruction and use them is true. But now we have an historical opportunity to change the regime to something better. So why not use it? I mean, the, the example about Burma and the other places, we should have done, done something about that too. At least we in the West, we shouldn't have funded these regimes. Absolutely. Okay. But you're so not now we have an opportunity to free 24 million people. To be killed. The people who will die are thousands of innocent Iraqi civilians. Well, yes, what will happen is that they have been oh, dying for oh, 20 years. Well, wait, Where absolutely. have you been? Well, exactly. That's Where a very have good you been? Hold on. Dying a Hold on, guys. Uh, Where have we been? Let me, let me just ask the man with the glasses in the second row back here on the edge. That war is the best way to go about that. Well, um, what do you think? Let, let's ask what you think. No, I don't. I think international pressure, I think we should continue what we're doing at the moment. For how many more years? We've had 11. Well, he's not contained. He, it's not about containment. There's a UN Security Council resolution that says he is in breach and he needs to disarm. There are, uh, how many more years who, do you who, want to wait? Oh, oh, wait, wait not, not, hang on. Not, not all at once. Let I'm him sorry, make his point. Who is he an imminent threat to? Why there are we not going in to a country Council who is an imminent threat, such as Israel? And also, why have we not North attempted Korea. to uh, remove the motive for terrorism? That's, a, well, that's what Absolutely. we ought to be doing. How, how irrelevant do you want the United Nations to be? What signal is this going to send to the rest of the world if we do nothing about this? I'm not saying we do nothing. I say we do not go to war. We maintain the And the only pressure. thing that has brought the weapons inspectors in and a resolution has been the threat of force. The man with the open neck blue shirt in the second row. Yeah, do you think that, um, Glenda, do you think that Tony Blair can survive politically if he goes to war unilaterally with the United States and Iraq? 
Well, I mean, I, I must be honest with you. I mean, the, the position three years down the road or two years down the road when we get next get a general election doesn't seem to me to be as central as what's going to happen over the next few months. And what is surely of overriding importance is, as we are consistently being told that we are now facing a new world, is that we acknowledge that we don't know absolutely um, what to do in a new world. But what I thought we had learnt surely by now is that don't use the tried and failed practices of war. I, I, I absolutely agree with that gentleman on the second row, that, that as we are now in a situation where the inspectors are asking for more time, where there apparently is cooperation, where he's passed a law saying that there will be no more manufacture of weapons of mass destruction, okay. you can laugh at it, but we actually believe what happens in our um, parliaments then we should give the world this opportunity and pull back from the slaughter of more thousands we will, of innocent people. We will pick up on this, looking particularly at the UN, looking particularly too at what is going to happen there and whether there will be a second resolution, whether there should be a second resolution and what Britain should do. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. So what happens next and what should Britain do? Uh, uh, Colin Graffy, if it is clear there is going to be a veto of any resolution, or if there is a resolution and it's vetoed, and America then decides to go it alone with whatever coalition can be put together, isn't that to say, in effect, in the new world order, might is right, and the views of the international community expressed through the UN are irrelevant? Uh, no, I think first of all, America will consult with allies and members of the Security Council to determine what action should be taken next. And whether it goes to a second resolution or not, you still have, as Francois said, authority to take military action under 1441 because Saddam Hussein has been in breach since 1990 of his ceasefire agreement of certain elements that he was supposed to do, the main one of which is disarmament. So why bother with the UN resolutions at all? Why not say, we've got the authority, let's because, go for it? Because I think it's important to go through international institutions. And the problem so is... So long is as they agree with agree. you. Well, yeah. no. Uh, no, because if the... Well, the same thing as we did in Kosovo. I mean, we knew we were going to get a veto in Kosovo, and we different. did it anyway. So, you know, it's you try and go different. through the international institutions, but the fact is there's a mandate in the United Nations Charter that says use of force is needed for security purposes and this is a clear example where you need to use force if he's not going to disarm and the choice is Saddam Hussein's. Let's put the burden back on him. He has the burden of proof to say where these weapons are. Francis Eisenberg. Yeah, uh, on, on the veto issue, I think we're actually in the, the ab absolute opposite situation we were in, let's say, 10 or 20 days ago. That is, uh, the, the shoe is now on the American foot. Uh, there is a clear and quite apparently quite substantial majority in the Security Council not to authorize force in the near term. Uh, and which you don't see that changing? Which, well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that changing. Uh, 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 an enormous amount of inducement or pressure was brought to bear ahead of Blix's uh, report. And I, so I, therefore, I don't see too much, uh, too much change occurring there. And I don't think uh, the Americans or the British would put on the table uh, a resolution which would not be passed. It would not be passed because there would be a Russian or a Chinese or a French veto. It would not be passed because it wouldn't get a plurality of the votes. Mm. Uh, and when I'm saying a plurality, uh, uh, I'm not simply talking about the need to have nine votes out of 15. I don't think the resolution would, make, would get much more than four or five. So I suggest the resolution will not be put on the table. We will see probably today or tomorrow whether the Americans will go ahead or not on the basis of 1441 alone or not. I, I suspect not, and in a sense I hope not. Because uh, you think that would be a dangerous uh, oh, I, uh, perversion uh, of, or dangerous interpretation of 1441? I, I suspect uh, that, 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 that it's, it's not a legal perversion of 1441, but it would indeed uh, provoke an enormous and uh, deep rift Absolutely. between the United States on the one hand and most of the international community on the other. That is a disaster which should be avoided. And I, I must say, I was rather impressed by, by the words of the, the young man uh, who's sitting uh, three 
we, uh, a little bit above me when he said, well, why shouldn't we try and see in the future uh, whether uh, the, uh, the German-French plan uh, couldn't be combined, as it were, uh, with the robustness of the, of the, of, of, of the American and British approach, avoiding the requirement for war in, 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 in the short term. But I suspect, we're not, have a, that, yeah. we, I suspect we're not going to have a second resolution anytime right. soon. Professor Prince. Right, look, we need to hammer down a couple of points because we're getting muddled. Firstly, 1441 is indeed legally permissive. It may be politically attractive to have some other permission, but it is legally permissive. Your question was, what should we put in a second resolution? My answer to that would be that it would be very prudent for the international community to prepare a second resolution about post-conflict reconstruction and the role of the United Nations in helping the Iraqis have a second chance. This is on the Iraqi assumption that, the, that the Americans go it alone or with a coalition. And that's the second point we need to hammer down. The Americans are not alone. There was a letter signed by eight European heads of state, which was then followed by ten of the so-called new Europeans, and we have the Australian Francois government. Heisberg falling similarly about so. to that. Yeah, yeah I, was, I, was, I, I was smiling because... Uh, uh, you know, it's Marshall McLuhan who said uh, some 30 years ago or so that it's the medium uh, uh, that is the message. <laughs> yeah. And in this case, the medium was a text which just anybody could sign, but as long as it wasn't the French and the Germans who were invited to <laughs> well, sign Well, I can it. understand Francois' uh, frustration and, because and, they were caught out by that uh, particular and indeed, one. <laughs> and, and, and indeed, it was an extraordinarily unwise move which split Absolutely. NATO down the middle, Absolutely. has made the Atlantic Alliance essentially dead, okay. has split the European Union down the middle, mm -hmm. and has, at the, at, at the end of the day, let to a, it led to a situation in the Security Council of these where the Americans and the British but, but and the Spanish are is, alone. His point is, America would not be going alone. There are other nations out there one that would one, want to disarm the One at the moment. I, there will I, be I, others. I just wanted just, to... Just, just, just on that, on that point. Point. Yeah. Come to your second point. Oh, just sorry. pick up on, on, on that point, if you would. Yeah. That in reality, although formally you couldn't get it through the United Nations, there are a number of other powers, as, as Colin Graffi is suggesting, that would go for it um, alongside um, the UK and the Americans. And I that think, would give it a validity. I think there would, that there would have to be... Uh, some major shift or some real evidence post the UN inspectors report on Friday and the clear moves for more time to be given for them to be given more facilities before it would be possible to incorporate more states in supporting into this coalition of the willing that the, uh, the Americans are talking about. Glenda, I simply just with? wanted to pick up on the point that was made about a post-conflict commitment to Iraq. If I remember rightly, we gave a post-conflict commitment to Afghanistan. I absolutely supported, I supported mm. that without reservation. The only area of Afghanistan where there is this post-conflict attempt to rebuild is Kabul. We're seeing the Taliban regrouping, we're seeing... That's not true. The, there are roads and we're infrastructure, the, there's millions um, and billions of dollars still being poured into um, Afghanistan. Yeah, governing their, their countries, the opium is, is being grown and harvested and sold, women are being denied education. So, so is that not of having... For having is it, is it, let's All look at, I'm let's trying look at, to... The point yeah. I'm attempting to work up to here, if we are serious about this, and if we are serious about helping Iraq if there should be a conflict, and please God there won't, to actually rebuild itself into a, a, a democratic state, we have to make, we, the international community, has to make the same kind of commitment to Iraq as was made to Japan and Germany after the Second World War. And I see no signs whatsoever of that commitment being met. Gwen Prince. She's absolutely right. She is absolutely right. And that, if you pay attention to what has been said in Washington recently, the Americans have realized that's what they're going to have to do. Look at the and congressional... they won't do it. They do. They Just are. Just for one moment, Glenn. Sorry, I'm sorry. Look, look, look at the Congressional Budget Office estimates for the next year, and you will see that the Americans know that the government of military occupation that will have to be put in to give Iraqis a chance is going to be on that sort of scale. Your point about Afghanistan seems to me to make one conclusion, with which I think we could all agree, which is that we should have tried harder, and that lesson has been learned. And it being learned in Afghanistan and it will be learned no. here. No. Yes. We made a promise. Yes. We Let said me... we would not walk away from Afghanistan and, and we haven't. were only they're... in Kabul. No, that's, are, not that's, not that's, that's, not true. that's not true. It ain't working it's anywhere not true. else. Let's, let's concentrate, let's, let's, we could concentrate on the, on the varying views that there are about what is actually happening in Afghanistan. Let's, let's stick with what we 
we've got now, and on the basis of what we've heard, which is a, a, a there's almost a consensus of competing views here, that it's very unlikely that there is to be a resolution that will go through. Therefore, it is very likely that the Americans will decide um, that they will take action, and therefore there will be a problem afterwards. And this, this disparate four, if I... Uh, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm not convinced yet. I mean, I think they will... I, 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 I cannot conceive that they would be able to argue now post what the inspectors said on Friday, that there has to be this immediate rush to war. I'm convinced that they will say, OK, we'll give them a little more time. They may attempt, I think the inspectors go back in another two weeks, don't another they? Another two weeks. They will that's... say then, well, you've had another two weeks, and if the report isn't as positive as it was on Friday, then the, the, the pressure may shift. But it seems to me at the moment everybody should be working for saying, this is what the inspectors have asked for. We worked hard to get them in there. Give some more time. And that's time. why we should be having a unified voice so that Saddam Hussein knows that we're serious rather than marching and giving him the confidence that just as he said in this interview that he can get away with Let it. Let me bring in now our audience again. Let me bring the audience no in again and, and you'll have a chance to pick up, I'm sure, on what they say. Down here in the front row on the edge. Yes. Talking about this whole situation, what I'm seeking is legitimacy. And under legitimacy, we need to look at the rule of law, first of all, and also listen to international law as well. Now, if we're going to have a situation of vigilante justice, whereby if you bring somebody to prosecute the person to the UN, you have to let the UN themselves be the judge and the jury. You cannot be the prosecutor and the judge and the jury. And that is what America needs to understand. That if Saddam that. has a problem, yeah, you no, bring we, him there and we, we you, find him guilty and decide what to do with him. If, you, if you're talking international law, we have three international law professors here, and we're saying that there is mandate under 1441 to use force. Yes, well, but you, George Bush called the UN an irrelevant debating society, it will, which does not it, help he the power it, of the UN he, to be able to deal with he issues. Said it so what will, we need is to give the UN he, legitimacy to yeah. deal with the issue. But America, unfortunately, although they might be doing the right thing, they're doing it the wrong way. We the, need legitimacy, America otherwise we should be through the can't United Nations. America is still going through the United Nations, and he said that it will be an irrelevant debating society if, if they don't do them. anything <laughs> about <laughs> the, the, the situation. Just let, let, Glenda, Glenda Jackson, we have touched on this before, but say, say yeah. Glenda Jackson responded to what you just said then. It will be an irrelevant debating society unless it agrees with the United States, which suggests that no, it's only relevant it agrees if it agrees. No, with its <laughs> own resolutions. It has passed... 18 Security Council resolutions. It has to. It has to have the will and Senator the Jackson. power to carry. Israel has it's failed to, to meet um, a UN resolution. <laughs> Turkey has failed to meet a UN resolution. <laughs> India has failed to meet a, a UN resolution. But Pakistan what, has but, failed but to meet a UN resolution. But what are you going to do so about this? So are we moving into a world no. where? I'm, I'm, automatic excuse I'm going to bring in our, 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 the, the man with the white sweater in the second row back. Yeah, fine. Um, what, what I find amazing is that there's all this banter, there's talking, there's paper shuffling. We've got a fantastic guy called Tony Blair. He's well respected by America. He's well respected by many countries in the world. Okay, not everybody agrees with him, but people do listen to him, and, and I do believe he's a good man. I don't believe on everything that he does. So you, if he says, we go, you'll be behind him? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, we, at the end of the day, we're all on for a common cause where... Um, the world wants to be a safer place, okay? And all the world is doing at the moment is arguing, stabbing people in the back, is all, you know, there's people in, you know, men in grey suits arguing the difference, what, whatever. But the world's got to be it's united. Because they disagree, that's why they argue. No, they're no, not no. Clear. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying is the world's got to be united and we've got to sort out these problems once and for on the planet because it's all well and good having America going rah, rah, rah. But at the end of the day, the Americans need Europe, Europe needs America, and we all got to live on this planet together. The man there with the glasses and the beard in the third row back. I it's no, no, with the no. third row back, with the glasses okay. and the beard. Oh. You've got a beard, you've got glasses, you've got a red tie, I can describe you even more fully if you want. <laughs> you just, <started. laughs> just get going. Me, anyway. Just get going, come on. Anyway, um, my point is uh, that uh, America failed to back uh, Stam's opponents after the Gulf War. And is this now a pretext being used, 1441, to clear up the mess? that they left behind after the Gulf War. It wasn't just America, yeah. Margaret Thatcher did it too. Well, you know, uh, America, America would failed. have gone in, but there was not a unified voice. The Allies were scared, they were worried, they didn't want to do it, and so they back out. The point that and, the gentleman was and, trying and, to make And when Glenda Jackson brings up the fact of all these other uh, resolutions being violated, mm -hmm. what in the Parliament, are you going to say we can't do anything about transportation because the health service is such a mess and we're not going to well, do something about health because okay, education leave that is there. such I'm a mess? I'm going to bring in, if I may, the, the, the woman who is here on the left left-hand side. You. Yes, you. Me? Okay. Um, words like, it's too late, 
11 years is too long is very worrying because it's never too long not to try and not go to war. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can split the world into hawks and doves. It doesn't help. We know that America at the moment spends 400 mil million on its military, something like 0.2% on conflict resolution. Can we not be on a military trajectory? Can we not seriously think about alternatives? I want to hear more about the Franco-German peace plan and the role of the UN in that. Well, let's do very briefly on that, I'll bring you both in. Fr Francois, first of all. Yeah, uh, two, two things here. First, on the legal position, uh, it must be acknowledged that the resolutions which the international community has adopted vis-à-vis -vis Iraq are of a mandatory nature. They're not of the same nature as those which have been alluded to concerning India, Pakistan, okay. or Israel. And Secondly, the on the Franco-German Franco business, one of the reasons I suspect why the Security Council uh, actually ended up not with a marginalized France and Germany, which is what everybody was crying about in London and Washington two weeks ago, but with rather the opposite, with Washington and London finding themselves in a box, was precisely because the French and the Germans, A, had come up with something, I think, fairly sensible, and secondly, because our American friends were seen as deliberately trying to split us and divide us, calling Germany a new Cuba or a new Libya. Uh, this is the sort of thing which destroys alliances, uh, aside from uh, dividing the European Union. We are almost, I'm afraid, I'm afraid... Also what the inspectors <coughs> said, they haven't found a nuclear weapons development. Right, we are virtually, hold on, we're virtually, and I want All to, to give Wynne Prince a very, very brief word. I'm very grateful for this lady's thoughtful point too. Two things to say. One, we are going through the remaking of the modern world. We are trying to set down the boundaries. We're trying to preserve the United Nations. Secondly, it is always the case, sadly, that you will not get compliance with people like this unless the threat of force is there. And for that to be credible, you have to be prepared to go through with it. Well, okay. can One I just say, I, I, yes, I, I take the point about the, the credibility of, of, of a voice saying you can go Linda. no further than this. It was it was the unanimity, I think, as much as the threat of violence that actually got those inspectors. And there back. we have to have, I'm afraid, a pause in this conversation. I have no doubt that we will be <laughs> returning to it again. Indeed, we'll be back again next Sunday. And if you'd like to join us in the studio for that discussion, then here's the number to ring. It's 020 7261 3784. Till then, have a very good afternoon.